There's so much activity and funding happening for scientific research and entrepreneurial ventures. But what about invention? Who is funding the inventors? And what can be learned from inventors to, to solve our customer problems? Welcome to another edition of our Engineering Masterclass by SciChat. You know, we have with us today an inventor, a hacker, and a technology futurist who's always been building the future, whether it's cryptocurrencies in the 1990s, um, AI for the stock markets, a machine to suppress hurricanes, or, you know, even the world's smallest PC. I'm talking about Pablos Holman. So Pablos, welcome. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Yeah, my pleasure. So Pablos, you know, inventor, entrepreneur, hacker, we very often loosely use these terms, right? And we interchange them with one another. Uh, but what differentiates an inventor from an entrepreneur? Uh, what does it take to be an inventor? And why is it that people are not so excited about funding invention? Yeah, I mean, I really think there's a kind of a life cycle to innovation and doing new ideas. And, you know, each of those, you know, each of those roles or, you know, the, the way we describe those people sort of uh, are responsible for a different part of the life cycle. And so, you know, in my mind, there's this continuum from scientific discovery at one end, which is really, you know, how do you figure, you know, how does the world work? And that's kind of what scientists are doing. So you want to um, fund that type of research. And, and, you know, in some sense, we've been doing that pretty well. And then, you know, at the other end, you have, you know, business people who are, you know, running sometimes massive institutions or global organizations. And then the steps along the way in the middle, you know, are, are really important if you're going to do something new. Because as you can see, the guys at that end do, doing global marketing, manufacturing, distribution, you know, they usually suck at innovation. <laughs> They're really good at doing the same thing over and over and over again and maybe a little faster and a little cheaper than before. So the way I see it, you know, I want it as an inventor, I want to take the output of scientific research and fill my head with that. I want to understand every new discovery. I want to understand all the things that scientists have figured out and ask myself, does this change anything humans have ever done? You know, that's the, that's the seed of invention. And if I can do it, and sometimes, you know, the answer is yes, oftentimes it is. But to do that, you also have to really understand the problems in the world. That's really the job of the inventor. But oftentimes, you know, inventors really suck at building a product or building a business or even engineering at times. So that's really where an entrepreneur comes in. Their job is to figure out, is this the right invention for the market right now? Is this the right invention that the world needs right now that somebody needs? And their job is to figure out if they can turn that into a business or some other kind of, you know, functional operation or project. That's entrepreneurs. And then, you know, those people often suck at, you know, growing and scaling a business and managing a lot of people and raising finance for, you know, uh, large scale things and handling the day in and day out maintenance of, a, of running a business. So, I just see that progression all the time. And I think that a lot of times when you see things breaking down, it's because people are not playing to their strengths. They're not learning to have relationships and collaborate with the people who are good at the things that they aren't. And it's because they're not you know, respecting that whole process and, and that you need people who are strong at all of them. Right. So Pablo, there's some amazing work that's come out of your innovation garage right from the lasers to kill mosquitoes to machines to suppress hurricanes, or even those insulated containers that you made uh, to keep vaccines refrigerated in Africa. So in your opinion, what are some of the biggest problems that you've solved and how did you go about approaching them? Well, I don't know if, any, if we've actually solved any problems yet, but what we're trying to do is solve one big problem of how do you scale up invention? And you know we've been pretty successful at that, and really that came down to trying to, you know, show that the inventions were valuable and that we could turn an invention into a liquid capital asset. You know, we wanted to show that inventions are something you should be able to buy and sell and trade. And the truth is, 
you know, that works the best when we embody the inventions in startups, <laughs> right? Because the world really knows how to buy and sell and trade a startup. They didn't really know how to buy and sell and trade an invention. But if you can tie the success of a startup back to inventing a new technology, then hopefully you can get more funding and more support and more attention for the invention part. And that's just what I think the world is really missing right now is we sort of overdid it on supporting and funding startups and entrepreneurs. And we sort of threw the inventors under the bus. You know, it's it's not likely that you know anybody else besides me that has a business card that says inventor on it, right? And that's, you know, because it's not really a legitimate career choice. You kind of have to, you know, do it on nights and weekends, and, and that's not good enough. We really need to find ways to to scale up invention. And I think you can, this is getting pretty evident in the fact that, you know, almost everything you see in the world that we call technology is really just software, you know? And software is amazing. We'll be able to do a lot of it, a lot of things with it. It's very powerful. And there's a lot of applicability of software, but we're not even trying on so many other things. And that's a lot of why we were so successful at doing invention at a large scale is that we didn't have a lot of competition. You know, not a lot of people are actually trying to invent other te types of technologies. They're mostly either doing software or they're underfunded. So, so you know, uh, given that there's so much research happening today and so much technology available, uh, should there be a shift in thinking in the way that companies approach innovation? Because uh, if I, you know, read this correctly, I think that there's mo more money spent in research for hair loss than there's money spent to cure malaria, right? So, yeah. uh, I mean, how do we change that way of thinking in big corporates where, you know, we get them to, or we inspire them to invent for masses as opposed to only for the wealthy few? So I actually think it's really important to make products for rich people. And the reason is we're trying to get their money. You actually want, like Robin Hood, you want to go get the money from the rich people, use that to test and develop a whole bunch of technologies, figure out what works, but then just recognize that the job isn't done when you made a product for rich people. It's okay to make iPhones and Teslas and you should buy them and use them. But the reason is we're trying to figure out which of those things are actually good so that we can then take that and develop it for the rest of the world, right? And that's the, that's where the job gets harder. And a lot of people drop the ball at that point because it's a lot easier to work on a problem that you have, that you understand, that you're close to. But those are like practice problems. You know, if you're living in the West, then you probably don't have any, you know, real existential problems. Well, you, what I think people should do is then take the, those skills that you've learned and try and apply it to solving a problem that you don't have, that a billion people have. And that's harder, but that's where all the action is right now. There's so many amazing problems that exist outside the developed world. So. Right, so Pablos, you work with a lot of industries and a lot of businesses in redefining the way things are done, especially using the superpowers of automation, robotics, machine learning, so what are some of the biggest changes that you're bringing about, especially with the shifts that have happened in this global pandemic? Well, look, I mean, I think the toolkit that you just described is extraordinary. And there's, if, if we don't invent any new technology for the rest of our lives, there's so much work to do just applying machine learning to almost everything that humans do. And that's what I believe is possible. I think there's power and the ability to use computation, to use these tools, the big data toolkit, the machine learning toolkit, the computational modeling toolkit, to be able to help humans make better decisions. And that's really what it comes down to. You know, everything that we're experiencing, you know, is, is in part caused by human decision-making, right? We need to learn to make better decisions. And in the past, it was tough to make 
good decisions because we had to use a lot of intuition and we weren't able to collect and analyze and process the, the amount of data you would need to do a better job. But now we have this extraordinary capacity for computation. And I think that's gonna change everything. And, and you know we can aim that at businesses and industries. We could also aim it at governments and societies. We can aim it at stuff, but we can aim it at you know the biggest problems in the world. And the, you know the project that we worked on at the lab to do some of that that was, I thought was most inspiring is we were able to use computational modeling to improve epidemiology. How do we go after um, some of these diseases that are really challenging in the developing world um, that people are suffering with all the time. It's not just the death, but people are sick, they're out of work, there's kids dying. I mean, it's a lot of problems and that's with things like malaria. And so by using computational modeling, we're able to make better decisions about how to go after those diseases and really plan an end game for how to eradicate them. And that's, that's extraordinary. We're doing that with epidemiology, but you know, we believe it should be done with everything. Right, so Pablo's given that you're a computer hacker, uh, what are your thoughts on quantum computing? What are the possibilities <laughs> that, that quantum computing can create for us in the next five years, 10 years? Mm -hmm. Oh man, I'm the last guy you want to talk to about quantum computing. I think that it's very overhyped. Um, we're at a point where we definitely need some breakthroughs. There have been some and there's been progress made, but this is very much an area of scientific research. You know, we have to come up with, you know, some fundamental breakthroughs on how to make quantum computers work. And we haven't done that yet. Um, there's work to do there, could happen any day now, but it could also take another thousand years. We don't really know. And I think that, you know, once you solve how to manipulate quantum matter and figure out how to make qubits and figure out how to make a lot of them and then figure out how to boot the thing and put it in some known state, you know, that's a, there's a lot of open questions there, but then we need a quantum OS and we need a quantum SDK and we need, you know, a, a, an ability programming language that you could use in that context. And those things are very nascent as well. And then lastly, if you had all that, what would you do with it? You know, in my mind, uh, it's very difficult to describe problems that I need a quantum computer for. There are a few, you know, there's some things we really would love to have a big quantum computer to help us with. And someday I hope we do have that, but I think it will remain irrelevant to almost everyone listening here for the rest of their career. So, Pablish, you're a big proponent of the idea that robots are only going to learn what we teach them, right? And so we've got to be better role models for technology and automation. But I think when it comes to our own personal lives, uh, if you talk about our happiness quotient or a sense of connection, a lot of people are not doing too well. So how can technology try to solve some of these human problems? Yeah, I mean, look, there's a lot of uh, a lot of things that contribute to happiness, like um, basic needs, you know, food, shelter, water, sleep, all of those things. And uh, we've done a really good job in the last couple centuries, in particular, of taking care of those kinds of needs for more and more people and bringing them out of extreme poverty. But presuming you've done that, it turns out there's a whole lot of other things humans need to feel happy, and feel fulfilled in their life. And I think that we're at the very beginning of understanding those things. And one, one thing I think is lost in a lot of the conversations, it's important to understand about technology in general, computers, robots, artificial intelligence, all these things, you know, those are tools for humans to use. And they're tools for us to exact our values into the world, right? So if you don't know what works and you don't know what future you want to create and you don't know what outcomes you would prefer and you don't know how to get there on your own you can't teach a computer how to do it they can only do what we teach them how to do and again going back to computational modeling things we could you know the computers could help us figure out not what the best choices are but what the possible choices are right and you still have to choose, of all the possible choices, which one do you want? 
that's human values. And humans really need to start getting clear about what they want. What do they care about the most? Because there's compromises, there's trade-offs. You can't have everything. And so what a computer could do is tell you what, what choices you have to make that are possible, but it can't tell you which one you should make if you don't know what your values are. And so I believe that that's a really important thing for humans to be working on. If, and, and to recognize that the computers and all these technologies, they're tools to help us, but we still got to choose what we care about. No, but, but thanks so much, Pablo. I think those are some really fascinating perspectives and it gives us a lot to think about, you know, the, the kind of values that we need to choose and what we need to focus on. So, so thank you once again. Thanks, man. I'm glad we got to do this.